I told I told him one day, I'll never forget this. He was going fishing at the Detroit River. And I told him, I was slow. I had a long day, I was like hearing that shit. He said, Pop, one day the whole world gonna know who the fuck I am. So we, we started laughing. And guess what? The whole world know who he is. So hear what I say, for it's the truth you see. There can only be one, the original. OG, two letters that define respect. Welcome to the original OGs. I created the original OGs to document the forgotten parts of American history. I want to recognize and give a voice to the men and women that have climbed to the top of their game. Believe me, the men and women that sit in front of this marquee have been authenticated as original OGs. My name is Mr. Rick. Welcome to my world. A world of the originals, the unique. Welcome to the original. Oh, jeez. Welcome to the original OGs. I'm your host, Mr. Rick. Today we have a, what I would consider a fascinating interview today with a friend of mine who's the father of a friend of mine. He's known as Pop Snoop. How you doing, my brother? How you doing, Rick? I'm fantastic, man. Hey, look, I know this is going to be a dynamite interview, mm -hmm. you know, so I want to get right into it. We're going to start building into it. We're going to give the people some information that I don't think they've had before. Mm -hmm. Very interesting uh, story here. So I want to start with, where were you born? I was born in a small town, Magnolia, Mississippi, in 1949. I moved to San Francisco in 1966. Wow. Spent two years there, and then I got drafted and went to Vietnam. Then I moved to L.A. in 1970. Right. That's where all my brother, bro, uh, brothers and sisters was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. So when you were in Mississippi mm -hmm. as a young man, mm -hmm. that was during the Jim Crow era, correct? Exactly. Travel with us back there and give us a picture of what that must have been like. Well, it it, it was like... You know, like if you if you was black, you you, you had a water fountain saying colored, then a water fountain saying white. My dad had a landscaping business, so he had clout. He worked for everybody in my hometown, mm -hmm. doctors, lawyers. I knew them all, right? Right. So I, I really never had no problem. Right. Okay. But it was like I knew I knew I knew to uh, stay in my place. Yeah, you knew the rules. Yeah, I knew the rules, right? <laughs> I, knew, I knew the rules. So that, that uh, and uh, like I said, I, I had a good childhood. To be honest with you, because mm -hmm. uh, all the rich, rich white people I worked for, I you know, uh, I knew their kids and everything. You worked with your father. I worked with my father. He had a big landscaping business, so mm -hmm. I know all, all the all the rich white people. I knew all their kids, mm -hmm. so they was my friends. You know what I'm saying? Right. But I, I never knew the difference between black and white. Right. But I knew what to do and what not to do. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Exactly. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, my family is from Mississippi, as mm. I've said to you. Mm. Mm. They're from Carthage, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I went to Carthage with Mississippi with my mother. I must have been about four years old. Mm. And uh, I'm probably close to 10 years younger than you. Mm -hmm. When I went to Mississippi, I saw the white only sign. Mm -hmm. They were still hanging. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my mother she would see white folks coming, mm -hmm. grab me, snatch me, mm -hmm. and get me off of the walkway, mm -hmm. you know. Now, that brings about an interesting thought to me because your father had his own business. Right. And you're living in the time of Jim Crow. Right. What do you think that was like when he was coming up? At that time, I know he explained it to you. Oh yeah, it was it was it was real rough because he, he was born in 1960. See what I'm saying? And my mom was born in 1920, so he he, he told me about, about all the things he went through. But the advantage he had by him you know, having a landscaping business, all the white people loved. Him. They, <laughs> they loved needed him. him. They needed him, right? Right? <laughs> yeah. And he made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, him and his sisters and brothers and all my grandfather now, my grandfather was. I only knew one of my mom's uh, father. Mm -hmm. He was born in the late, in the late 1800s, and my grandmother was, right? Right. He died when I was nine years old. Okay. But they took us to school, okay? Wow. On what to do and, and told us what they went through. 
Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting, man. Yeah. My grandmother used to sit around and talk about what it was like when she grew up in Mississippi, mm -hmm. in Carthage, Mississippi, mm -hmm. and the attitude mm -hmm. of the people there. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was it, it 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 put something in me that took the fear out of me mm -hmm. about different cultures in America, mm -hmm. you know, because there was a fear factor there, mm -hmm. you know, and my grandmother would, would tell me, hey, you know, when we were growing up, there was just certain things. I mean, you know, she would tell me that there was just certain things that they didn't tolerate. Mm -hmm. And her brother and a couple of others got ran out of Mississippi because mm -hmm. they responded to some things that they just didn't tolerate. Exactly. And, True story. Yeah. You experienced any of those things in your life? Yeah, my, uh, yeah, my, my uncle, my, my mom's brother, he was always getting in trouble. And during that time, and most people I grew up would move to Chicago mm -hmm. because they had the meat pack, the, the meat packing plant. Mm -hmm. They had uh, they had the steel mills in Gary, mm -hmm. and everybody was going to Chicago. Just yeah, so have my family, my father's people. They was in, they was in uh, in California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for every time, every time uh, they would come home, they was driving brand new cars and stuff. You know, Cadillacs. You know, said exactly deuce in the quarters and stuff. They would bring the whole family down, and they would uh. Leave the kids down there for the summer. Matter of fact, that's how Emmett Till got killed. Exactly. He he lived in Chicago. He came down, and they say he whistled at this white woman, and she later on said that she lied about it. And his first cousin turned him in to told told the white people where where his grandfather lived at, and they came to his house and drug him out of the house, and they killed him. This was a normal situation, right? But well, it, it get worse than that. It get worse than that. Uh, when they, those three, two white guys, the black guy got killed in Philadelphia, okay, they got, uh, they found them that maybe about a week later. But those ones that everybody know about, they made the news. Right. But it was way more than that that got killed. Exactly. Right. <laughs> there was a bunch right, of right, people right. that they didn't talk about. But let me say this. Back in my day, they had, they had night, they called them night riders, right? Mm -hmm. You have a, a truck full of white boys, three in the front. Four in the back with guns, uh, chains, and baseball bats. Then had a chase car with six white boys in it. They would ride down through black communities. Because during that time, we had dirt roads. Right. The white people had, had pavement roads. We didn't. Right. And I, I wonder why my mom and dad kept us on the back porch at night. It was because of night riders. Exactly. Okay. So I lived that. But at the end of the day, I didn't have my animosities against them because one thing my mom, my, my mom told me, love everybody. Right. Okay. I, I, I mean, I have, like I said, I had white friends because I worked for them. Exactly. Yeah, so, and I seen the houses they were living in, and I told my dad one day, <laughs> I said, one day I'm going to have a house just like this. Wow. And here I am. Okay. Exactly. And my dad told me, you can have anything you want if you're willing to work and take care of your money. Due to your family's landscaping business, mm -hmm gave you certain privileges mm -hmm. that other blacks didn't have. Exactly. Because I know my experience there, there was outhouses right. and different things of that nature. My, right. my family lived on a farm, so right. there was work to be done. Right. You know, but you seem to have escaped some of that in a way. Right. Because of your fortunates with your Father. But see what you're saying. My grandmother, she had a had a outhouse, right? Mm -hmm. And back then, we had an outhouse. We had a bathroom. We had a, had, a, had an outhouse. And back then, we we didn't have running water. We was kind of upper class car. We had a pump. You can go out there and start it up. And right. Water inside the house. My grandmother had a well. A well. <laughs> and that's and this this water we're drinking right now. Mm -hmm. Taking prayer to the water. I drink oh out, my out God. Of that well. Now I, I didn't care how 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 hot it was. That water was the best water I ever had in my life. Stay cool. Right. Then we had a farm away from my house. We had chickens. We had cows. We had goats. Uh, uh, we had guineas. We had we had duck. We had geese. Cause my dad had a lot of land. Mm -hmm. We had ponds and stuff. Wow. So back then, back during that time, you had big families, but everybody farmed. So right. we lived off the land. Exactly. And I, and I still, I've been playing the garden ever since I became a homeowner in 1975. I grew my own food because that's what I'm used to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, so... Back then, man, people, people were self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
people people back then was a lot stronger than the people nowadays. Exactly. People don't realize that. No, I realize it. Some people know how to, how, how to live, but everybody don't know how to survive. Okay. Okay. Big okay. difference. So I know how to survive, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Big difference. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I can remember, and I know you know this better than I do, I can remember when I was there with my mother, man, we shook peas until the sun went down. Thank man. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand? Uh, you snap peas. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh -huh. You know yeah. what I'm yeah, saying? Right, right. And then had to go down the thing and pop them out of there. Exactly. Hey, man, I, I thought that was the, I thought my mother was punishing me. No, she wasn't punishing you. <laughs> you know no, she was feeding you. <laughs> exactly. I didn't know. I never experienced anything like that. I'm used to concrete everywhere. Right, you Chicago. Let me tell you, I got one worse than that. <laughs> My dad had a barn on our farm, right? And the, the worst thing I hated, hated to do, he had, he had two trucks. We had to go down through our cornfield and pull a coin. Go to the <laughs> barn and, and shell the coin. He had a big bucket, right? We had to fill that bucket, about four or five buckets up. Wow. And, and he would take it down uh, 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 to, to the coin gin, and they would make the coin, the coin mill out of that, mm. okay? Then every October, they have, uh, they would kill hog. See, a lot of people don't know about that. <laughs> right. Right, you, okay? Sloops, my son's great, great uncle, Mr. Percy McGee, lived, lived down the road from us. He was a butcher. Then what they would do, they would get uh, four or five women from the neighborhood, had a big table, so once you killed the hog, they had a big barrel, the barrels that you barbecue, mm -hmm. that you barbecue in nowadays, hot water, you have a big, exactly. big, a big black wash pot. You put the hog in it, you put the hog inside the, that, that big barrel. You get, let, uh, let the hair get real wet, take them out. Mm. You, you take a, 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 what you call a block and temple that you, that you take engines out, out of the car with. Mm -hmm. You got a, a two, two sticks up like this, one across, and they would jack them up. They take a number three tin tub. Something we used to take a bath in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I've done that. Right. They scrape, they scrape all the hair off, off of them. Then they would, was Mr. Person would go right down his belly. All the insides follow, follow the number three ten toe. Mm -hmm. And they said from the rooter to the tutor. They mean the rooter they, to they, the tutor. Everything. <laughs> the, the nuts, the hog tongues, pig ears, all that. And my main thing, I was waiting on, I was waiting on hog crackers. Exactly. They put them, they chop them up. <laughs> the women would chop them up. Put them inside the, uh, that big black wash grease. Okay, that, that was, that's how you got your, your grease. It wasn't no canola or okay. <laughs> no, no, wasn't none of this shit. Okay, then you got a smokehouse. Man, take a two uh, your ham and stuff. A smokehouse was a, 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 a little building, right? Mm -hmm. And you use hickory wood. You two. take the hams, hang them up. You put smoke on them. You rub them down. Okay, you put salt on them. Back then, people knew how to cure food. Right. Back then, it wasn't no refrigerators. We had the ice boxes. Wow. That ice man would come by, he, and he would sell his ice, right? He had a hook. Pick mm -hmm. it up like this. Put it inside, put it inside our freezer. This is for black store having refrigerators. In that ice box. Right. Then my dad bought us a, a deep freezer. We had a house on the side of our house. My mom did a lot of fishing. So a deep freezer, man, we had enough food to last us for six, seven months. Mm -hmm. Fish, I, I had fish. My mom was a hell of a fisherman. And we had fish. So back then, people ate. I look at people nowadays, they eating bullshit. Yeah, they, they, they eat healthy things. Yeah, right. That's why they, most of these young, like my grandson, why I asked 14 shoe. That's from going to McDonald's and Penn Pizza Hut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and these kids nowadays, they really don't know that, like I told my grandkids, I'm a pioneer. Mm -hmm. So I took them to school on, on what I went through. To let them know y'all been blessed. Exactly. Okay, we got our first TV in 1957. Okay, back then, you had an antenna outside. You had to send somebody outside. <laughs> turn that antenna. Turn the antenna. Okay, go back the other way. Oh, hold it right there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Then about three or four years later, they came out with this, they came out with this uh remote. You could turn it and go click, 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 click. And I had a motor on the antenna and once, you, once the TV got clear, it would stop. Wow. But we didn't have time to watch no TV. My whole, <laughs> exactly. Hell no, I, my dad was working the hell out of me, man. Right. Yeah, so that's the era I grew up in, man. You know, even though we had come out of the slave era mm -hmm. into the Jim Crow era, mm -hmm. we still knew how to sustain ourselves mm -hmm. from the land. Mm -hmm. 
We ate healthy. Mm -hmm. I can remember being in Mississippi with my mother mm -hmm. and she would feed me red dirt. Yeah, we, we, we clay, we used to eat that. Yeah, yeah. We used to eat it. Yeah, right. It was full of iron. Right. You know, the people <laughs> stayed strong, man. I'm just, right, right. You know, I'm just saying how life was so much better in so many ways. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. and things have changed now and we're really soft people. But um, I want to, I enjoy, I'm enjoying that conversation mm -hmm. so much. I hope the audience is. I want to come back to Emmett Till a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, because this really affected the country in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. He was from Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm from Chicago. Mm -hmm. But it affected me differently than it affected you mm -hmm. being in Mississippi. Right, right, right. Share that with us. Well, you know, back then, like I said, before we, uh, we had television, everybody had radios, right? Mm -hmm. And my mom, she was a radio person. And when you got killed, I, I, I think I was six years old. They said Emmett Till got killed. But it, it wasn't, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know where he was because he, he was up in northern Mississippi where mm -hmm. your folks are from. Mm -hmm. So my mom, she, uh, she was saying, she said, it's a doggone shame he came down from Chicago because his mom would bring him down for the whole summer, like, mm -hmm. like people in my in my neighborhood, they bring the kids down, leave them there for the summer. Right. Emma Till was clean. He was dressed just like you, and they he went to the store one day, and, and the, the white lady said said it uh, said it uh, he he uh, whistled at her, right? So what happened was, like I said, his cousin told them told told the white people where his grandfather lived at. They they drug him by the house, beat him up, put his head in the fan, and. Wow. And when his mom came down, she had to had the casket open. She wanted everybody to see mm -hmm. what they had done to him. So, so, but the guys who did it, they they walked they walked they, they walked on that. Okay, I think about wow. four or five years ago, the lady said, that, "Oh, I lied about that." Okay, wow. And, you know, a lot of blacks got mad about that because if you if you lied about it, why aren't you in jail? Okay. Yeah. But she was on a deathbed. She was on, on a deathbed, right. So back, during that time, man, like I said, my dad would always tell me, he said, all these, these rich white people you're working for, they was the ones that, that was giving the Klan money mm -hmm. to, 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 to uh, come at us, okay? So my dad, he knew what time of day it was. And as I got older and older, I began to realize what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, when I got drafted, when I got drafted and went, and went to Vietnam, all, all the white guys from Chicago, New York, they, uh, Detroit, they was, they was used to being around blacks. So <clears throat> now you've gone to California. Right. You're getting ready to be drafted. Right. Uh, the question in my mind is, in this period of time, where do you meet Miss Beverly? Me and Beverly grew up together from the same hometown. It, in the city. Right. Okay. Be Beverly's grandmother, Miss Maul Tate, she was a midwife. Mm -hmm. she, every kid on my block, she delivered every baby on my, on my block. Mm -hmm. Her name is on my birth certificate upstairs. Right. Okay. Beverly Stoops' grandfathers and his great grandmothers. Back then, if you, was, if you was black, you couldn't go to the hospital and have a baby. So they right. had midwives. Right. So she's delivered all the all the kids on my block. So I've been doing Beverly all my life. Okay. Beverly's brother was married to my sister. Oh wow. Okay. Her her brother was my classmate. Mm -hmm. They left and moved to California in nineteen sixty three, but they moved to Long Beach. Okay. I left in nineteen sixty six. My brothers them they went they moved to California in sixty three. Junebug and George and mm -hmm. my sister and all of them. So me and Beverly go back a long, long way, man. And and we started we was boyfriend and girlfriends. I was like 14. She was like 12. Okay. Right. That's how far we go back. Yeah. So Miss Beverly moves to Long Beach. Right. Her whole family did. The whole family. Right. Okay. I get it now. Mm -hmm. So at what point in this time period does Miss Beverly become impregnated with Snoop? Okay. I was 22. Beverly was 20. And 
she really was married to a guy in the Navy. I never, I never even met the guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister, Aline, she passed away two years ago. Make sure rest in peace. She knew the man Bella was still in love. Okay, right. So we would meet, meet up at her house, and he was he was out to sea. We didn't give a shit. We didn't care about that. So when she, when she got pregnant, uh, my sister told me, "Oh, Bella's pregnant." I'm thinking this is her husband's. Son. Right. <laughs> so what happened was when Sue was born, October twentieth, nineteen seventy one, my sister called me. She said, Bernard, she said, Baby Beverly just added your baby. That's how you know. She said he, he looked just like you. <laughs> so from that from that point on, I would go down and pick up Snoop. And he would cry, he always crying. Because he was confused. He didn't know he, he didn't know who I was, right? This went on until he was like twelve, thirteen years old. Wow. Okay. 13 years old, Bell finally told him who I was. So my, my sisters and my brothers, they knew who he was. Right. So from 13 years old up until right now, it was me, it was, it was me and Snoop. Okay. And I, he, he, to be honest, me and Snoop are twins. He's just like me. <laughs> yeah, he really. Yeah, he, Tell that yeah, again. He's he, he just like me, okay? <laughs> okay. He's always been smart. He's always been creative. And the things he's doing now in, in his business, I tell a lot of people, they ask me how, how would I des uh, describe him. He's a genius. Hey, I would have to agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. the brother's a genius. Yeah, he's a genius, yeah. So, we're, we're going to revisit that. Okay. This show has the intent to define what a real OG is, what an original OG is. My partner and I have developed a method to ensure that if someone should sit in front of this OG logo, that they have been authenticated and found to be true in their history as far as what an OG is. We're going to pick up when you go to Vietnam. Okay. I want to see, I was in the military. I was in the army. Okay. I have some experience there. Mm -hmm. I can't, I went in, in the Vietnam era. Okay. They didn't send me to Vietnam mm -hmm. because you all were coming out. Right. This was in 76 right. for me. Vietnam War ended in, in April 1975. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying I went in in 76. Right, right. You guys are still coming home. Right. So I go to Germany. Okay. Now, I don't want to tell that story. Right, right. But what I think the audience wants to know and... What I definitely would like to know is leaving or living in a younger age in Mississippi, mm -hmm. being drafted and going into the military, mm -hmm. the racism was still there when I got there. Right, right. So how did that look to you? Well, here's the deal. Well, uh, when, I went to, when I got to Vietnam, like I said, the, all the guys that was from the city, like New York, Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore, D.C., Jersey, all the white guys, they mm -hmm. were just, they was just been around blacks. Okay, they was cool. Right. It was the one that was from down south that was just treating blacks. Thank like, you. It was the ones from down south that we had to deal with. You know, we were, we, we, uh, they be playing uh, Hank Williams and Tim Wynette and Johnny Cash. We playing Motown. All right. Four tops, Temptations, you know what I'm saying? Right. And this is doing mm. this is doing stand down like every eighteen days we come back to our base camp and have stand down. But we knew that the, we had to fight. Right. So this one guy named Baker, he got killed, baby, rest in peace. He was from Arkansas. Man, he was real he was real close. Wow. And he he really good he didn't care about what what, what color he was. I mean Right. It was just it, it, all of them liked it, right? Right. For me and Baker got tight. So, you know, I was in 241 firefights in Vietnam. Wow. We had 73 kills one night. Wow. I was I was wounded three times. I got hit, the first time I got wounded, I, uh, my squad leader got killed, my lieutenant got killed. Me and this guy named Ryan from Michigan, we still talk to one another. He found wow. me on Facebook. He, he lost a piece of his ear. I never forget, he jumped off, of, I was on a track, right? He jumped off the track and he dragged, he dragged, he dragged my, he dragged my, Squad leader beneath the track because they was dropping mortar rounds. They was falling like right. rain. I got hit in the back, arms, legs. So they sent a dust off to pick us up, helicopter. It was a bad day that day. A lot of guys got killed. 
and they flew us in John Cage to the hospital. I stayed at the hospital for like about two days run, was there for two weeks and I came back to the bush. But like I tell my grandkids that, that if I, if I would, would have got killed in Vietnam, it wouldn't be no sleep. So that man up above looks out for me, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. But when I got back from Vietnam, I left Vietnam to Vietnam. A lot of guys don't want to talk about it. I talk about it all the time. A lot of guys couldn't leave Vietnam in Vietnam. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I, I experienced guys in the military. Right. They would come to our unit because mm -hmm. I was infantry. Okay. So these guys were coming out of the bush, mm -hmm. coming amongst us. Mm -hmm. They were having serious problems. Right. 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 I mean, this thing was eating them alive. Right. Man. Right. You right. Know? They just couldn't separate the two. Exactly. And right, right. I'm astonished at how solid you are. Mm -hmm. You know, because it doesn't normally work that way. Right, right. You right. know. Right. So that's very interesting. And th th this may be interesting to you. Mm -hmm. um, so Snoop, mm -hmm. uh, he signs with Death Row. Right. Number one draft pick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's having problems with Shug. Right. He's a young man. Right, 18 years old. He's your son. Right. This guy appears to be using guerrilla tactics. Yep. You're a Vietnam vet. Right. Know how to kill mm -hmm. professionally. Right. What was on your mind when you're being communicated to that this guy is intimidating, and that may not be the right word. It's the right word. Your son. Well, what happened was, I was living, like I said, I lived in Detroit for, from 85 to 95, right? And I got to his first job at McDonald's on 8 Mile in Woodenham. I worked about eight, five, about six blocks down from here on 8 Mile in And So, when he finished high school, he called me, he called, he called me and said, hey, Pops, I just hooked up uh, with this uh, rap group called Above the Law. I really didn't know super rap. Cause he's, he's, <laughs> right. right. He, real, he, he real quiet with his stuff. And I said, who is that? He said, it's a rap group, Pop. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Motown. I'm a singer. Right. I'm there going to Motown, going to Motown all the time. Right. Okay. I grew up, I grew up with, with R&B, blues You're and You're a vocalist. Jazz. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so he called me back. I never forget. He called me back about a week later. He said, hey, Pop, he said, fuck, he said, fuck up Above the Law, Above the Law. He's up with Dr. Dre. I didn't know who Dr. Dre was. Right. So. You don't know this is the Holy Grail. Right. During that time, I, <laughs> right. During that time, I was supervising, right? So right. A lot of young guys that I was supervising, when I told them about it, you know, I, was all, I was cool with all of them. They say, hey, man, if you're son with Dr. Dre, he's going <laughs> he to make way more money than, than your dad. He's going he to become a millionaire. I'm thinking they pushing. Right. Right. So my friend Tommy Davis, he came on my house. He lived walking distance from me in Detroit and brought my album with NWA. I didn't know who, who these guys was, man. Right. Yeah. So when Snoop came out with his first, he, uh, he called me in November. He said, Pop, I just, wrote, I just wrote my first song with Dr. Dre. He said, I wrote it in an hour and 45 minutes. It's deep cover. He said, it's a movie with Lawrence Fishburne. It's coming out in January. Go see the movie and buy the soundtrack. Because back then, a lot of rappers got in on soundtracks. Right. So I go to the movie, I eat my road, me and a couple of guys, young, young kids. <laughs> you see the movie, they play this this record. I was like, they sound pretty good. It sounded damn good. Yeah, still, you still shocked me, because I'm thinking, I don't know, he was always rapping, but I told, I told, I told him one day, I'll never forget this. He was going fishing the Detroit River. And I told him, I was still, I had a long day, I don't feel like hearing that shit. And, <laughs> and, and this, is what, this is what he told me, he said, Pops, he was 15, it was me, him, and Tommy. He said, Pops, one day the whole world gonna know who the fuck I am. <laughs> yeah, 15 years old, he said that. Right. So we, we started laughing. And guess what? The, the whole run no years. Knows. <laughs> okay? Okay. The whole run no years. So what happened was, he called me, he said, he say, Pops, Dre and Sugar want to meet you. They, they want to know where, where I got my music, mu musical talents from. Right. So they flew me out to, uh, out to L.A. I think it was like March. So what happened was, what happened was uh, Suge and Dre flew me out there, right? Yeah, I know the Deep Cover has, has sold, sold a whole lot of records. Stupid just got out of jail. Uh, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was dealing crack. Him and Warren G and Nate Dog. Right. So when he came to the airport to pick me up, I'm up. I'm suited, all suited up, and 
I don't think I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish jump in the limousine. <laughs> I ain't seen a stupid about a year and a half. But it was him, Dad, and half there picking me, pick me up at the airport. We walk outside. I'm looking for a limousine. They driving a 1978 Monte Carlo. It had enough Kentucky uh, uh, Popeye chicken bags and McDonald bags in it to, to take to, re, to, 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 to the homeless shelter. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> The first thing is two bags, please. Say, Pops, you got $10. I looked at it for $10 away. He said, we need some gas. I was too. You just sold over making copies on deep cover. So I, I, I drove the car. It was a big sea child's car. I filled up full of gas. Going to his apartment. He was living on, Whit on Whitley. Uh, Whitley and Franklin, between Franklin and Sunset. Solar Records that uh, did uh, Dick Griffith on. You know, he had the whispers, mm -hmm. Babyface and all them. You could walk to it from Sip's apartment. So I get to his apartment, I, I see all these drug addicts outside. I said, God damn, man. <laughs> so we go inside. Soup had a sign on, on his refrigerator saying, if you didn't bring shit, don't fuck with shit. But what? I opened up the refrigerator, there wasn't shit in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I went to the store, bought him some food. The DOC, Doc was living with him. You know, Doc, EZ found him in Dallas, Texas, right? But when he got his first check, he had an accident. He lost his voice. Dr. Dre? No. DOC Doc. Oh, okay. DOC. He lost his voice. So he was he was staying stupid at the time. Mm -hmm. they, they was broke. I couldn't believe it. So what happened was, I went to the studio the first day I got there. It was a solar record. It was on the sixth floor. And when I walked to the studio, I seen a whole bunch of gangbangers in there. Pants hanging off their off their ass, and I didn't know I had never met Dr. Dre, so I he was sitting he was sitting there right, and somebody just told me that's Dr. Dre. So I actually I said, "Are you Dr. Dre?" So yeah, so I introduced myself. So they was recording, and I'm listening to all this rap music calling women bitches and hoes and stuff. I asked Dr. Dre. I said, "Is anybody gonna, anybody gonna buy this shit?" He said, "Man, we going platinum." I didn't know what platinum was. <laughs> right. I knew what gold records was, but I knew what platinum was. Right. They was working on the chronic, okay? So, we was, just, we was at the studio for almost all night long. Go, you know, most artists record at night. So you go back to the hotel, you go back to the apartment. The next day, we was going back to the studio, Dr. Dre pulls up in the DMW, because he had, he had left NWA because I asked you about left, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't, know, I, didn't, I didn't know that he was broke. I just met the guy, you know what I'm saying? And what happened was, he told Stoop, he said, man, we're not, we're not going to the, stu the studio today. And Stoop said, why? He said, because Suge shot up in the ceiling last night. And then if you watch uh, Death Row uh, tapes, he shot inside the studio, and Dick Griffith kicked him out. Okay. Then I finally met Suge. Suge didn't have no money. No, he was just a reg regular guy. Suge ain't got no money he at this point? Then, uh -uh. Didn't, none of them had no money. Wow. They just get kicked off. Right. And at the end of the day, it wasn't death row. It, it was nothing. So what happened was, when they, when they, they did the chronic, uh, uh, Dick Griffith had got them a deal because you know, he owns Solar Records. Right. And I think he was, was going to give them like a dollar twenty-five cents a record. Jim Levine and David Gaffin that ran Interscope, they, the Interscope was going down the drain. So Jim Levine. Went behind Dick Griffith's back wow. and, and told uh, Sh uh, Suge them, how much money is Dick Griffith giving y'all? It's about a dollar seventy-five cents. Jim Levine said, I give y'all five bucks. God damn. So what happened was, the chronic saved Jim Levine now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so when the chronic came out, it was really Dre's album, right? So when it came out, Snoop called me one day and said, Pops, we're coming to, to Detroit on a promotional tour. I didn't know what, what a promotion to tour was. I was still living in Detroit. Right. He came to Detroit, and they had a show at the Club International on uh, Southeast Detroit, down the river. I go to the uh, to the club one right, and Time Stoop and Dre got on stage. They saw throwing those thick glasses that you drink liquor liquor out, out of. Mm -hmm. So I throwing them on stage. One ricocheted hit me, hit me on my ankle. I went down to the floor. And, and student was doing it, they was, they was blocking the class, but they were still rapping. Wow. So after the show was over, we go back to the hotel. It was right downtown Detroit. And 
it was a whole bunch of girls. Well, that, that was, this is my first time seeing a groupie. I had heard of them, right. but I had never seen none before. So it was a whole, it was a whole, it was a whole bunch of girls lined up, lined up at, uh, uh, at the elevator. But sure got the whole floor blocked off. So once the floor got full with the women and everything, Sugar, he would let he would let nobody else in. Mm -hmm. He put me to the curb. Say, pop, he said, "Come, come, go on tour. Come hit, hit a couple sitters with us, okay?" He, 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 sure, he had all, I have, have always treated me nice, right? Right. So, I hit a couple sitters with him and stuff. And then after that, no, and then Stu reached in his pocket. He had four pockets full of money. He said, "Pop, you need, he said, let me get your room. I have sleep. I said, I got a house, man. <laughs> That's four, <laughs> right, <laughs> right." So I was keep your money. I said, I'm glad you're making money now. And during that time, they was making money. Right. So Soup and Dre left and went to New York. Dad's now jumped on the tour bus. They were going to the next city. But Soup and Dre now, Soup and Dre now was. Why are they going to New York? They was going to New York uh, uh, to, for uh, 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 Rolling Stone magazine. Oh, okay. Yeah. To do, uh, I mean, it, it, everything was moving. No, it, it's happening now. Now it's happening, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy for Soup, right? So. So at the at the end of the day, uh, I go back. I get I get back home, and I get a phone call from Milwaukee. This mm -hmm. news reporter called me. Wow! Sugar made sort of some had tucked the limos, limousines from the drivers and riding around Milwaukee. They beat them up, took the limousines. Okay, Snoop told me, "Hey pops, I'm back in L.A." And he said, "You said you heard what happened?" I said, "I heard it. I, said, I heard about it." So I didn't think nothing of it. You know what right. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing the game. So after that, in '95, when Sue came up, when Sue came out with the Chronic, I mean with uh, Dog and Style, we, well, it was Chronic. It was Deep Cover first, mm -hmm. then the Chronic. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, murder was the case. Okay. Then when Sue came out with Dog, came out with Dog and Style, he sold eight hundred thousand records in one week. Wow. Okay. Because he had caught that murder case. Right. So that being said, he said, "Pops, pack your shit and tell the post office to kiss your ass." Five days I was gone. I took early retirement, seven years. Right. So during that time, here I am. This is this is my livelihood now. I'm in I'm in the game now. Right. Still had a big mansion out in Claremont and stuff. Not knowing it was Shug's mansion. Right. Uh, he was leasing houses for one. I noticed what, uh, when I went to Canada. Every time I would go to Canada studio, they had sandbags when you walk inside, like Vietnam. I'm, I'm looking at this shit. They had sandbags. Wow. So shoot, I'm looking at all these big guys, bunch of hell, neck bone, mob Jane. This is all super shoots homeboys from uh from Compton. Okay. So I gotta think and I said, man, this don't look right. Okay. Stoop, stoop is a crypt, 21 insane. Right. Shook had both of them together. Bloods here, crypt, they all the same building, right? And I didn't realize Shook was doing all this stuff. And I noticed that Snoop, Daz, and Corrupt, them, they was not happy. Corrupt, RBX was the first one to leave Death Row. Mm. Okay. He went out there and got a deal a week later for a million dollars. And Snoop them wondering, how, how do you do it? Snoop them was still new in the game because they didn't know shit about the game. Right. Okay. They just making rap. Right, right. They just want to be behind the microphone mm -hmm. and, uh, and be on TV. Yeah, I get it. Okay. So what happened was uh, Roger, Roger Troutman from Zap, him, him and his brother, they was all. They was all. Was always. Always said, "Can't have studios." So what happened was, man. Uh, Ramps Lewis songs came out from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Kevin and Kelly. Sure brought him. Brought Kevin and Kelly out. He brought the LT Hutton out, which wrote wow. the movie All Eyes on Me. Yeah, yeah, I know LT. Yeah, 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 right. So, stupid had already told me. He said, hey, "Pops," he said. Be careful what you say in Can't Have Studio, cause Sure got cameras all over the place. So that's, once again, I'm, I'm new to the game. Right. So what happened was, one day I got I got a phone call from Rams' little son Kelly. Rams had bought Kevin a brand new Benz, right? He had it delivered to Ken Adams Studios. Mm -hmm. Sure got some guys from Compton, motorbikes, and they bitch living shit out of him. Kelly got away. Uh, Tony Green, the play played bass for the for the genetics. He got away, but they beat his girlfriend up. So my, wow. They kicked the teeth out. Suge had, had, had a room called the Red Room. If you watch the movie All Eyes on Me, you'll see a Red Room. He would get you back there, have his homeboys hiding in closets, 
And the time you get inside, they whoop your ass. And these are big guys, man, you know what I'm saying? Right. So it was November 1995. Uh, Suge had a meeting. And he asked, Tupac was in jail. He said, who wants to bring Tupac to death row? Snoop and Dad said, yeah. Snoop and Dad said, man, bring him to death row. We know him. Right. I met him, I met him in 93, but I didn't know him. So when, when Pac came to death row in 95, the first thing Suge did, this is how Suge was getting people. He bought him a Jaguar. Bought him jewelry, Rolex uh, watches and all kinds of stuff. And the first night I met Tupac, he let me drive his Jaguar back out to Clarewood. He, he was always coming out to Snoop's house. I didn't think nothing of it. But don't forget, Tupac, he was already with Interscope. Right. So it was, and the Interscope was doing Death Row's distribution. So all, all it was, it was like a transition that Jimmy Levine wanted to get rid of Tupac because he was called Tupac's drummer. When he became the Shooks, Death Row, he, he, blended, he blended right in because Death Row right. was drummer. Right. You feel me? <laughs> so Pac, when Pac came to Death Row, this is no lie, he stupid and was scared because Pac was, he was already a star when he came to Death Row. He had Who was already a star? Tupac was. Okay. He already, already had records. He had did movies. Boy, it's just, just mm -hmm. all that shit. Juice and all that, right? So, but the next thing I noticed is that the thing he should wanted to do with Pac, Pac didn't want to do it because he, he had been in the game. Right. Before Suge. So, that being said, I could just look at Suge's eyes while he was sucking on that goddamn Cuban cigar, <laughs> looking at Pac all funny and stuff. But the next thing I noticed is that you giving Pac more attention than more attention than Suge then. Right. Because it's, it's new money. Right. Right. So Pac did uh, this album, All Lives on Me. I spent two weeks in the studio with him. He, he put Dad, Snoop, and everybody on, on the album, right? And Pac sold, I think he sold about $300-something million dollars of records when it came out. Suge had, Snoop had moved to, 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 on Worcester Boulevard. Suge had, had a penthouse for Snoop. Had one for Tupac right next door. I was frying some chicken one day. I was a cook. I was a goddamn errand boy. I was all there for Snoop now. Right. Yeah, because I, I was like, follows all of them. Right. Okay. So that being said, Pac came and knocked on the door one day, rung the, rung the doorbell, came in mad as hell. I said, man, what's up with you? He said, hey, man, I'm pissed off. I said, I said what's up? He said, man, I sold all these records. He said, I went to the bank today, and mm -hmm. I only had $250,000 in the bank. And he said, I'm, he said, I'm finna sue death row. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, in, in 96, Snoop was in New York with Pac. If you watch the movie, he was in New York with mm -hmm. Pac. And he told Pac that he really didn't have no, no beef with Puffy now. Pac wanted Snoop to roll with them to get that Puffy and Biggie. Snoop wouldn't do it. He said, I just want a murder case. And he said, I'm right, I'm he not going to get in none of that. I, yeah, he said, she said, I love those guys. So that, on the way back, if you watch the movie, I got five scenes in the movie. Sure, I got two private planes. He, he told Told my brother Jewel and them, fly on this plane right here. Stoop flying with us. So when Stoop get on the plane, it's all blood. Bunch of air, all, all the sugar's ass whoops. Stoop grabs a knife, sits, sits in the back, and flew back to LA with him. So I'm like, Stoop, man, I said, what's going on, man? He's mad. He said, Pac won't speak to me. From that point on, Pac never, never spoke to my son again. He was pissed off. He, pissed off about what? Because Stoop said he had love for Biggie and, and, and Peter. Oh. So he got pissed off behind it. Sure of them got pissed off. Because they, mm -hmm. they, they're thinking the stupid side of them. Right. But Peter and them, Peter had, had beef with Snoop. I mean, with Sugar. Not Snoop. Right. Okay. So after that, man, uh, when Pac got, got killed in Vegas, uh, Suge and, and Pac went to the hospital, but Suge got, got out of the hospital because he went to school at UNLV. So he knew all the mob guys, right? Right. He had a house in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. He flew down to, uh, to Mexico. I never forget me. It was me, Snoop, Nate, Dog, Warren. We, we was all up in Toluca Lake at the uh, at the apartment, and it was a, it was breaking news. And they and they, uh, they, mm -hmm. they started arresting all the Shug's homeboys. And I told Snoop, I said Shug will be next. So the next day, Shug, I seen Shug walking with two two attorneys, David Kenner, who won my son's murder case, and this other guy. I was Snoop. I said something wrong with this picture. But what he did, he violated his probation. That's how you get up. Sure, yeah. That's how you ended up in jail. So when you went to jail, Dad's, my nephew Dad's was really running death row, him and him and Reggie Wright. Sh uh, Shug's a uh, security guy that mm -hmm. I, I, I really didn't care for. I don't know how Master P found out. I, I had seen Master P 
at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles in Hollywood. Dad's knew who he was, but I didn't know who the hell he was. Hmm. But the same guy that gave me my distribution deal on my first album, the West Side Riders, gave P, which is East Florida's office, St. Charles, gave P his first distribution deal on Ice Cream Man. Hmm. P was living in Richmond, California. His grandfather passed right. away. He had a record store. He moved back to New Orleans, which I grew up 45 minutes from New Orleans. Right. So one day, I, I, was, I, was, I was doing something. I was cleaning up, and the phone rang. And I said, hello, I was, who is this? He said, man, this is Master P. I said, Master P. He said, man, he said, man. He said, he said Papa Soup. I, he said, I know who you are. Bring your son down to No Limit. Wow. He kept calling me every day. Bring your son on down to No Limit. Not knowing that my, my second cousin was working for him. Right. So I pulled Snoop to the curb. We had a long conversation that day. I was Snoop. I said, Master P, won't you come down to No Limit Records? Because during that time, we wouldn't know how to deal with Snoop because of Tefra. Right. We'd do, no labels in a record wouldn't labels. touch you. Hell, no, they wouldn't touch him. <laughs> P saved my son. Okay? Right. So what I told Snoop, because T was out there shooting a video. And we went to the video shoot. Video shoot and T and Snoop started chopping it up. About a week later, he flew us, he flew us down to Baton Rouge. Okay. And like I said, I know New Orleans is like the back of my hand because all my cousins are down there. It's 45 minutes from my hometown. Right. And the first thing I noticed about P, the difference between P and Suge, Suge didn't give a shit about what went on in death row. <laughs> right. Master P gave me a piece of paper. My do's and don'ts. You can't, be right. the, you can't be in the studio with Snoop. You can't do this. You can't do that. I had to respect that. Right. That's why I see my doctor, okay, he's different than Suge. Right. I ain't got to worry about getting shot at. I fight my way out of the situation, right? So I stayed down there for about two weeks with Snoop. Flew back to LA. I was going back and forth, but it was a perfect situation for Snoop because my hometown in Baton, uh, is 72 miles from Baton Rouge. So it's, every time I would go down there, my mom was still living. Snoop's great grandmother was still living. Mm -hmm. His other grandmother was living. All his aunties were still living. I would take him to Mississippi every weekend. I wanted him, him to know his people. Right. So got that out of the way. And by noticing that his music changed when he got with when he got with uh No Limit, mm -hmm. uh, the beats by the pound it was Moby Dick and his other guy they was making all the beats, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't that that that, that death row sound. Right, Doctor Dre was that, that was that was all right. Dr. Dr. Dre. It was that thing. <laughs> right. So the last album Snoop did for Dre was Last Meal. I knew what that meant. I'm his dad. I knew Snoop like the back of my hand. Right. Last Meal I mean that this is my last album. But what P did do for Snoop. He took him to school on being a businessman. P had bought the, the governor's mansion inside a golf course. And, and the people didn't like it. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Louisiana's full of Cajuns and Creoles and Italians and Jews, right? He told Stu, pick, uh, pick out a house. Stu found his house, him and Shante. P gave him the deeds to it. Wow. Go pick out two cars. Got a car for Shante, got one for Snoop. So I was going back and forth, man. So. The last concert I went to with Pete was in Detroit at Cobo Hall. And Snoop was just laying down. And I'm like, I'm saying to myself, hey, man, what's wrong with you, man? I can tell you that he, he wasn't happy. I was Snoop, here's the deal. I was, you done took P overseas? You done put money in Suge's pocket? Niggas in Suge's pocket? You done put money in P's pocket? I'll get your own shit, man. That's when he started, started dog, uh, dog, style dog style. Dog style. Dog style records. It took him 12 years to find the right people to get him to where he is right now. Right. He finally met with, with Ted Chong, did our own Cashmere Entertainment. And that, that all, all the things you see him doing right now, it's because he found the right people. You know, in this business, man, you're going to find all kinds of right all, all kinds of right people in, in the music business. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, me, when, once I did my album, I got away from it. This is what right. I do right here, film. Right. Okay. But that being said, when he started, when he started his own record label, he was a one-man show. I, he, he had this group called Dog is Angels. Some shit went down with them. I don't know what it was. I never got into Stu's business. I was just around for all this, all this bullshit, right? Right. <laughs> and I told Stu, if this is music business, I don't want to be around it. Right. No, God, I'm not. I, I, I was with Temptation all the time. I've been around the OJs. I've been around all these guys. And they all got sad stories. But when they first came into music business, they all got screwed. Exactly. And I began to realize you, can, you can't trust nobody. You can't trust your accountant. You can't trust your lawyer. You can't trust nobody. <laughs> so now Snoop is in full control of his own thing. Own thing, period. So when people call me and say, man, your son doing this, you're doing that. So what? Why are you calling me? That's his thing. That's his thing. 
What do you do is what do you do? Don't it's be his call, business. Yeah, but don't be calling me, telling me, oh, man, I'm doing something for your son. I don't feel like hearing it. Okay? I know who Soup is. You're doing something for my son. Right. But why, why are you telling me, though? That's between you and Stu. Right. They called me from Vegas. Man, one guy called me from Detroit. I'm going to stay with Stu. No oh, shit. No shit. No okay? Shit. I was homeboy. <laughs> you called me this time of night for that bullshit. I said, I said, real, here's the deal. I said, I know who Snoop is. That's my son. I said, but don't be a damn groupie, man. Okay? Because you sound like one right now. Right. Okay? Don't ever call me again and tell me what Snoop is doing. I don't keep up with Snoop, man. Right. Uh -huh. I'm a grown man. Right. And when I go out to L.A., when I go out to L.A., me and Snoop just talk about music, man. This is about my family. I got six great grandkids, four grandkids. And what we do, we get together as a family. I cook for them. And we just chop it up. You know what I'm saying? Right. You're a family. Right. But I've never gotten into Snoop's business. But one thing Snoop knew about me, he opened up a lot of doors for me. And what, you, what we're doing right now, it's another door just opened up for me. Exactly. But I've been around this game long enough to know that, that the story that I'm telling you right now, I never had a chance to tell the, sto the, the stories to nobody. So for Snoop, I've been with Snoop for 31 years, man. But the thing about it, what if he does? That's not surprise. It don't surprise me. That's who he is. I, I've gotten used to just seeing this guy mm -hmm. break glass ceiling after glass ceiling. Exactly. I told Snoop one time, mm -hmm. we did the PIMP. Uh, the PIMP, yeah. Yeah, yeah video. Yeah, with 50 cents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. I was in that video with Snoop. Right, right, right. And Nelly had already came out with Pimp Juice. Right, right. And I told Snoop, I said, man, it's going to be hard to beat that Pimp Juice, man. Mm -hmm. Snoop looked me in my face and told me, he said, man, when we get through with this shit here, they ain't going to even remember they put Pimp Juice out. I, I, <laughs> I said, oh, really? Mm -hmm. He said, Mr. Rick, watch what I tell you. Just a show of shit. He sure said, did. Man, this dude here knows this shit for real. But let me move fast forward. Don't be Martha Stewart's show. Right. She got a subdivision two and a half miles from here. Oh, really? Yeah, she built, she built over 100 some houses, man. Wow. The landscape job up front, she had to pay, I'm a landscape designer, right? Right. She had to pay at least a million dollars for, for Damn. Brian Jordan, they played for the, for the uh, Atlanta Braves. He was building one across the street. But it, I don't know what happened, but it went, it, 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 everything stopped. But Martha Stewart's subdivision, she sold every last one of the houses. Wow. So I'm t I, like I told Stu, I've been watching Martha Stewart from, from the time she started, 20 some years ago. I said, the only thing you have done to her was reinvent her to a younger crowd. That's all he did. He reinvented her to a younger crowd. Now he's doing something for the Super Bowl. Hey. Dre, Eminem, Mary J. Blige, Ken Lamar, they performed halftime. Right. And guess who looked it up? Jay-Z. He was, he, he was one of them. Right. Yeah. That's but, cold. Yeah, so that, that being said, man, like I said, from from the time soup from the time soup got into the music business up until right now, you just straight fifty years old. Here, here, here's what comes to my mind mm -hmm. when you say all of this. You started out as a vocalist, right? You had your share, right, in that, right. So, how 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 do you feel? When you see Snoop at the height that he's at, mm -hmm. and you came through that uh, as a father, do you feel like my son is living through me? Yeah, he is. I mean, it's just, we, that's something we talk about all the time. What my sister, she passed away two years ago. She was the first one in my family to uh. Get into the music business. She's a stacks record. Mm -hmm. Piano player, keyboard player, singer, songwriter. She, she wrote two songs for Barbara Bland, Come Fly With Me and To Be Friends. It was up for a Grammy. Okay. And I came from I came from a whole line of keyboard players. I got about 13 in my thumb right now. My my dad's side, singers and piano players. My mama's side, guitar players and singers. Mm -hmm. But I uh when Stu when Stoop came out, the first thing he said, hey Pops, he said, I'm gonna do it for you. He, That's cold. Yeah, he, he remember when we, when my brothers had a gospel group. My brothers just passed away. Right. And we cut a couple records at Malico with the Jack right. Southern Nears. Mm -hmm. we, we knew the Williams brothers because they grew up about 10 miles from us. Right. Okay. But he said, Papa, he's, he's, I did it for the whole family. 
Then my nephew, Dad's the dog pound. Dad's the crook. Dad's mm -hmm. my nephew. That's my sister's son. Oh, wow. Snoop was going to, what, what's going to fool with him? Dre wasn't going to fool with him. So I talked to all of them. I said, man, they give him a chance, man. Dad's was a producer. So the name Dad's, Snoop gave him the, the name Dad's. Right. So Dad's been in the game 31 years just like Snoop. Cool. So let me ask you, what was mm -hmm. and what is mm -hmm. your dream in all of this? My, my dream in the scheme of all, all this is really, it's fair, really. Okay. I, I tried music, came out with the album. I'm, the album's still selling, but I'm not, I'm not seeing the money from it because I didn't know the game. Okay. Let's go. And my dream is to film a movie about Vietnam. Okay. And since all these duels are, is open for me, I'm doing what I, I'm doing whatever it takes to get to that point to, to where I can do it. Right. My nephew does want to shoot something on me. He want to shoot a, a, a documentary on me. My main thing was, my biggest dream was to be a real estate mother. Right. Okay. My dad had, had a lot of land. Okay. I became that. I became a real estate mother. Okay. But my main thing was to see my son go out there and keep doing what he's doing. Right. And then that, that's that's been accomplished. Right now, my grandkids, my oldest grandson, he raps. My second grandson rap. My other grandson, he's gonna try out for the NBA next year. Right. My granddaughter, she 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 has uh she has uh three hit records out. Curry do. Wow. So that being said, the only thing about it, my grandkids, they're not hungry like Stoop was. Stoop then was hungry back in the day. Yeah, because they ain't broke. Right. So, <laughs> so you, if you listen to the Chronic album, right. a lot of people said Dog, the Dog Style was a hell of an album, but I still got to go to Chronic, I'm tell you why. It wasn't the best song on the album, and that was a hard album because they was hungry. It was a do or die album for Dr. Dre. Chronic was that. And Chronic thing. was the, what's the, what's the, what's the bomb, okay? Dog Style was the bomb. Then All Eyes on Me, okay? Death Row did six, out, six albums, made history. I think the first year they made close to a billion dollars. Wow. Yeah, but they was getting half ass paid. Right. They said RBS was first on the lead. Dan Corrupt left. He was gone for like four years. Okay. You know, Corrupt was real cocky and stuff. Right. Shug's wife was, Shug's wife, uh, Sharita Shari was Snoop's manager. Dad's not Corrupt's manager. This is this how Shug was working now. Mm -hmm. Rich Wright was running Shug's security company. But it wow. was really, in case okay, he was paying Shug's wife, I think 15, 20%. He was paying for security. And plus he was on death row. So Shug was like robbing them blind. Right. He gave them enough money to keep them afloat. Right. Now, as you know, Snoop just bought Death Row. Right. I don't know. I don't know how much money he paid for. Plus, he running A and R at Def Jam Records. Yes. Right. But like I told him, I talked to Snoop two days ago. I said, "I'm glad you bought Death Row, man. I'm going to tell you why. You build Death Row. Your music build Death Row. You are Death Row. Yeah, you are Death Row. But it really, it was Snoop. Like everybody was picking back off him. So now you got Death Row back. Him and I think him and Harry O. Right. Harry O was the one that gave them the money to start Death Row. Right. I met Harry O at the birthday party and he was there. Yes. Right. So I had never met him before. But it was a good feeling knowing that my son then, 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 then got back what, what he deserved. Exactly. Which is Death Row Records. I didn't even know Harry O was out. Yeah, he out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you, I saw, you saw him at the birthday party. Yeah, I've learned that. Yeah. Uh -huh. You yeah. know, but I, I get this broad picture of things. Mm. You did mention you want to do this movie on Vietnam because I can sense that there's some real shit that you need to yes, tell I do. people. Yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I, trust me, I get it. Uh, on the way of doing that, where, where, where is where is your heart right now? Where's my heart at right now? Yeah, for you know to, and and we're talking, you know, we're talking industry business. Oh, my heart right now, like I said, my heart, my heart right now is on film. Let me tell you why. By 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 me doing film, as we know, film brings music. Right. Everything you watch on TV, you got music behind it. Film brings everything. Right. So my thing is like this. When I do film, I got my grandkids, they get their music. They're the first. They don't sound like these rappers down here. Right. They damn good. But my oldest grandson told me, hey, Grandpa, why should I put my music out when my dad did the force? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to push them and stuff. But one thing, one thing about, about, about my grandkids, man, they ain't got that uh, like stupid. Well, they're not in that space he was in. Right. Exactly. You know, the right. the, the, the the refrigerator ain't empty. Right. right. <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? Right. right. Exactly. Right. Hey, man, I get it. You yeah. know, yeah. I went to prison to a, to get away from that. Uh-huh. 
You know, I I, I didn't mind taking a chance mm-hmm. because wasn't nothing in the refrigerator. Right. So I get it. If the refrigerator is full, shit, man, we're doing what we want to do right now. Exactly. The last thing I want to say is it took 27 years to make to a Hollywood Walk of Fame. A lot of, a lot of people thought everybody, everybody, everybody getting the top of Snoop. Everybody thought he had made, made to a Walk of Fame. He made it two years ago. That was the icing on the cake, man. And I, that was it. I, yeah, I posted it, I posted it on my Instagram from 1195 North Street. Everybody knew my family was, was off the music to the Walk of Fame. We did it. He's there. Right. Nothing can take him out of that space now. Right. And that star ain't going nowhere. Never. Right. Like we say on this show, mm. that's it. That's all. Yep. We have created this show so that men and women alike can come forward and tell their truth. If you have people that you believe to be an OG, go into the comment section, write us, let us know where to find the history so that we can authenticate it, bring them on the show, tell their story so that we can add to the American history. That's it. That's all. The original OG.